Good morning, East Hill Church. We are so excited to worship with you this morning. So good to see your faces. Would you stand with me here in the house? I want to welcome our online audience. Guys, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to challenge you this morning. We're going to step into a time of worship and, and a celebration. Um, if you're like me, maybe you're walking in this morning carrying a little something extra. Maybe you're a little low, a little down. Maybe there's something going on, sickness in your family. Maybe a little bit of um, some heartache going on there. Um, I want to encourage you that we have a God that is above our circumstance in all cases. And so we get to step into a moment of worship this morning that transcends all that. We get to step in and go, God, I give gratitude. I give my heart. I give my best to you in the midst of the hurt, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the broken spot that I'm in. Amen. Do you guys believe that this morning? Let's celebrate him this morning in our worship. Let's go. And I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I made. Come on, church. I was breathing. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures. Thank you for your faithfulness. 
God, thank you that you always show up. You are so, so faithful. We're here to worship you this morning, Father. We're here to declare your promises, that your promises are yes and amen over our lives, over our families' lives, right? Your promises are yes and amen. Thank you, God.
seat at the table. I know who I am. I know who I am. I have a seat at the table. I know who I am. I know who I am. Sing that again. And I have a seat at the table. I know who I am. I know who I am. just come and be accepted for who we are by the Lord. You don't have to work for his love this morning. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah. There's nothing that we could do on our own will to earn his grace. Mm -mm. No, no. He knew that and that's why he sent his son Jesus. Because nothing that we could ever do, struggle, work, toil, all of that, no. He just says, come to me, all who are weary. And I will give you rest. You don't have to put on a show. You don't have to be an A plus student. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. No, no. You just have to come. Come as you are. So come as you are today. This is your invitation online. This is your invitation right now to come. Bring yourself to the Lord just as you are. And all you have to do is receive his love the grace he has for each one of you this morning. Let's receive it. Let's lift our hands and sing this. You won't make me. You
fire fall down. Yes. Oh my goodness, anyone else sweating? Uh, <laughs> online, is it hot in your living rooms where you're at? Because it is, the room in here is woo, muy caliente. I love it. So we're gonna continue in our spirit of celebration by greeting one another with, may I add, enthusiasm and giving our tithes and offerings. So to do that, we've got QR codes on the seat backs in front of you if you're in the house. Online, there'll be one popping up on your screen. And we also have boxes around the perimeter of the room. So go, be free, greet with enthusiasm, and give your tithes and offerings. We love you guys. Welcome to East Hill Church. We are so glad you're joining us for our Sunday experience this morning. Hey, we're about to head into service, but before we do, would you encourage someone right now by saving them a digital seat? If you are on easthill.live, you can simply click on the invite button that will be displayed in the chat section and then follow the necessary steps. If you're on Facebook Live, you can share our Sunday experience with all of your Facebook friends or you can tag at least five friends in the chat section. Let's be the church by encouraging someone this morning with the love of Jesus. Hey East Hill, I'm Pastor Nate and I want to welcome you to church this morning. We are so glad you are here. If you're new, maybe this is your first or fifth time with us. Either way, we'd love to get to know you better and get you a welcome gift. You can text new to the number on the screen or you can go to easthill.org forward slash new. Another option if you're in the house is to scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you and click the new here option. Once you do that, you can tell us about yourself, check out some sweet informative videos and did I mention that welcome gift? Oh yeah, I did. Okay, moving on. So you've been attending for a while and you're wanting to get connected, get information and get in the game. Well, here's where you need to go. Visit esil.org forward slash info and you can be added to our email list or update your contact info. You can also check that seat back in front of you for that handy QR code. Scan it with your phone and find the link to take you to what you need. Connecting with you is so important. So help us help you and scan that code. Do you need prayer? Our prayer team would love to pray with you. If you would like to receive prayer, just go to easthill.org forward slash prayer to submit your prayer request. East Hill lies in the exact center of the city of Gresham. We love partnering with the city and intentionally finding ways to be an active part of helping our community thrive. This October, we are collecting tons of candy to hand out during the Main Street Halloween event in downtown Gresham. Please help by donating individually wrapped candy and we're expecting 2,000 kids to come through our East Hill campus. That means a lot of candy. Drop off your donations in the foyer by the check-in counter for Kids Ministry. East Hill family, we're so happy you're watching with us. Now let's dive into the rest of our service together. So why do we call ourselves Foursquare? Believe it or not, it has nothing to do with our skills on the playground. No bobbles, double taps, or Texas twisters. Back in the 20s, our founder, Amy Semple McPherson, began referring to the message of the gospel as being four square, which back in the day meant solid and balanced. Amy's message focused on four essential aspects of who Jesus Christ is, and those aspects are easily represented by the logo before you now. The first box, the cross, represents Christ the Savior. 
Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God who died on a cross to pay the price for our sins. Because of His sacrifice, we can actually have a relationship with the Creator of the universe. The second box is a dove, which represents Christ as the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized, a dove came down and landed on Him, showing the Spirit of God was one with Jesus. The Spirit of God does the same thing today. In fact, we describe our movement as Spirit-filled, because the impossible is possible when people are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The third box is a chalice, which represents Christ as the healer. Jesus cares and is involved in all of our lives. Whether our issues are emotional, spiritual, or physical, God has the power to heal the deepest of wounds and cure the darkest of afflictions. And the final box is a crown, which represents Christ as the soon coming King. Simply put, Jesus is who He said He was. No matter how dark or confusing the world may get, Jesus will be returning one day to make all things right. So there you have it, four squares, representing four aspects of Jesus Christ, making a four square doctrine that is solid and balanced. We may not agree on every little aspect of how we live our lives as followers of Jesus. As long as you join with us in believing in Christ as Savior, baptizer with the Holy Spirit, healer, and soon coming King, well, your faith sounds pretty four square to us. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Yeah, come on. It's good to be. How many would say it's good to be in God's house? Come on, let's give the Lord a big shout. Come on. Come on, it's good to be here. It's good to see you. Listen, for those of you that are online, we want you to know that we count it a privilege to be able to join you, whether it's today, whether you're getting a rebroadcast, whether you're working out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or somewhere in the future, thank God for you. Those of you that are watching live right now, one of the ways you can participate with us in the mission of God here through our ministry is to start a watch group or text a few friends and say, join in, be a part with us. I'm going to be shouting you out throughout the message, trying to make it sure that you are a part of what we're doing. Aren't you glad they're with us this morning via technology? It's good. It's good. So, so listen, we, you know, I wanted to put this video up. It's a great resource from Foursquare. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Foursquare organization and that type of thing this morning. But all of that information is available for you. Those of you that want to follow along in the message this morning, go to the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Or it should be one up on the screen in a minute, however you will. The notes for this message will be there for you as well. For those of you that want, what I didn't finish my sentence was, is those of you that want to know more about Foursquare, just go to foursquare.org. All of the information is down on the website, real user friendly, but we're a part. I think it's important for you to know that we aren't an independent church, that we are part of a larger family within. How I many of you know, first of all, there is this church universal of all times, then there is the church of our day, right? So there is, just so you know, we aren't some special group of people that are doing something different in the body of Christ. I mean, no, there's one church in our city. There's one church in our world. There's many distinctive little things about different churches that make them distinct and unique, and they contribute different things to the body of Christ. But just so you know, I'm friends with the pastors in our community. I'm friends with the pastors in our city. So you can't come here and say, oh, we're here because you guys are better, and I'm being fed more over here or that type of thing, because those are my friends, and I love them, and those our brothers and sisters, and they're doing the best that they can. And you are here because the Spirit of God brought you here. Hopefully, you didn't come here because you were offended or hurt or mad at somebody, because I'm going to send you to go get that right. Yeah. So, you know, and we pray for the church, not just our church, but the church. When I drive around our community and I see different churches, different expressions, whether it's Presbyterian, whatever it is, I pray for those men and women of God that have given their life for the gospel to shepherd them. We have a unique contribution. We're part of a unique tribe called Foursquare. That's our particular tribe. I mean, no, your family's not better than other families. It's just unique. It's your family. And so for us, this is 
Foursquare is our larger family. We've got about 1,500, 1,700 churches nationally, but globally, we've got probably, last count I thought I heard was 98,000 churches globally all over the world. And so you're, you're a part of something much larger than what is just going on in East County. I want you to realize that you're part of a vast family. And so that's a blessing, amen? And so th that's part of what I want to get at this morning, because this morning, this is the last installment in the series called This Is Us. If you're here for the first time this morning or just tuning in for the first time uh, in this message, there are other messages that connect to this. It is sort of our reorganization, refocusing ourselves on our mission, our values, who we are, and our unique contribution and expression. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was take some time as the fall was launching to re sort of dig some wells, lay foundation, put things in the ground so that you would know who we are as a church. You can make a quality decision, sort of preempted the things that we normally would do. We normally have altar calls and different things like that, and I preempted that for three weeks. But just so you know, it's coming back next week, amen. Because uh, I think every time we get together, people ought to be able to give their life to the Lord, be ministered to, prayed for. Another thing that will be added going forward, there's a prayer team that will be across the front here that anytime you come to church on a Sunday morning following our series of messages, whether it's me, whether it's anybody else who's ministered, there will be people here down the front that have been praying for our church, that are anointed, trained, and ready to minister to you. Because how many you know life happens? And so sometimes we won't hit a thing in a message, but that doesn't mean you can't get ministered to. There'll be people here that we love the opportunity to pray for you about whatever's going on in your life. Amen? Amen. So the last message. And so what I wanted to do in this message is I wanted to deal with our distinctives. And one of the things, that's why that video was in, in, essential for us, because one of the things that's distinct about us as opposed to all of the other churches in the East, East County area and, and, and in our city is that we're a four-square church. And so that means something. We're not the only four-square church, but we're the only four-square church like us. Come on, y'all. We got a little something, something about us that's a little different. And some of the things that we're going to emphasize as a church are important for us, that, that are unique to, to who we are in this leg of the race. And so we'll see at the end our legacy as a church before we leave this, after, uh, this afternoon and send you out to lunch. We've got a video I want you to see that chronicles our journey and the legacy that we've inherited. And I think it's going to be really good for you. But, but when we talk about distinctives, we're talking about a characteristic of a person or thing that serves to distinguish them from others. So, so there's something unique about you. There are unique traits about you and your wife that are different than somebody else's marriage. You don't compare. You just thank God for who you are, yes? And so for us, I want to go through our distinctives as a church, and you should have those in the QR code. Those of you online, they're available for you as well. And the very first one that, that if, you, if you thought about this, I got a diagram that we're going to be using and you'll see it again and again. It's, it's sort of, if you'll imagine like a, like a Roman sort of structure that has steps that are going up, that has columns to support it, and then a roof, that's sort of how I'm going to walk us through from the bottom all the way up to the pillars that keep the house upright to the roof that covers. Does that make sense? The very first thing that I want to talk to you about is the Word of God. That's got to be distinctive in our gathering. That distinguishes us from just a club or a gathering of people that are getting together to do a positive thing or a spiritual thing. It is the Word of God. Say it with me. Say the Word. It, it is essential that you and I do more with the Word than, than what my grandmother did with her Bible. Her Bible was, was a collection point for programs and fans and flowers and all of this stuff, and it sat in this Bible, and you couldn't touch it. Come on, somebody. And I remember it, but you know, I can't forget it because it wasn't just the Bible. It was the, a white, holy Bible. Big old, gigantic thing sat on the table and it had all this stuff stuck in it. But, but here's the funny thing about it. I, I know that Grandma loved Jesus. I know that she prayed. I don't ever remember watching her read the Bible. I don't ever remember her reading. But we had a big one, and I knew I couldn't touch it. But I don't remember her actually reading the Bible. And, and let me just say this. This is for free for those of you that have children at home. Let me just say something to you. If you want your children to live for Jesus into their adult years, and you want your grandchildren raised in the admonition of the Lord, and you want a generational legacy, kids don't do what you say. 
They do what you do. They do what you do. More is caught than is taught. My kids know that church is important, not because I said, you got to go to church. Although I did say that when they were teenagers, they said, I don't want to go to church. It don't matter what you want to do. You getting out of my house. Come on. <laughs> you going to God's house this morning. Kids, hello, adults. Kids don't get to make, kids with a, with a malformed brain don't get to make eternal decisions. So you lived in my house, guess what? You were going to church. And the church became, and it wasn't that we were going to make a show in the church. We served. We served. They served with us. When, before they even knew they were serving, they served. Can we help? Yep, you're going to help. Grab that lawnmower. Grab that, grab that vacuum. Move those chairs around. Pick up that trash. They learned early that we had a value in our house for the things of God. Yep. And they knew that their mom and dad had a value for the Word of God. Now, it's, 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 it's difficult to say that you know God and you love God and yet spend no time in the Word of God. How can you know Him? And, and it, I only imagine, here's, here's one of the challenges that we have in our culture right now. Young people are, 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 are there's this catchphrase, and young people are dismantling their faith. And uh, John Tyson was in, I was, I was reading, or actually not reading, but listening to and watching a video on communicators, because I always want to get better as a communicator. I want to constantly sharpen myself in my presentation. And I was learning some things from John Tyson, who is not American and, and is a, is a uh, pastor in New York, good guy. And uh, he said this, though, it caught my attention. He said, the challenge that we have in our generation is we no longer live under the word. We no longer live under its authority. It used to be a time when you were growing up, uh, in my house at least, and my grandmother, and even though she didn't read it, she said, well, the Bible would say, and the God would say, and I'm, I, now I'm older. I'm like, how did you know he said that? You know what I'm saying? Her pastor was telling her, but, but, but she couldn't read, though. She only had like a ninth and eighth grade education, so now I understand why she didn't read volumes and, and that type of thing. Because where she had come from as a sharecropper, uneducated as a black woman in the South, she had come up and did the best that she could. Amen? But, but, but here's what is the challenge right now for you and I. We literally have no excuse not to have the Word of God in our lives. Because you can watch it, you can listen to it, you can read it in every translation available. I mean, when I grew up, you can only read it in the King James. Anybody remember? It's the only authorized version of the Bible. And if you couldn't get the hither, those, and thous together, man, you were in trouble. Now you can read it in, in modern language. They even, look, look, they even got a Bible called the Ebonics Bible for black people. I ain't reading that. Come on, y'all. Better give me a regular Bible with some English words in it. Come on. There's something to be said about living under the authority of God's Word. Where, where John would say we've now become a culture that lives above the Word of God. Not, we don't sit under it, allowing it to read us. How many of you recognize you don't read the Bible as much as it reads you? It exposes you and I. It challenges us. And so when you live above, when you are living above the Word of God, that means you get to pick and choose what it is you like, if you want to have sex and do it as much as you want and you don't want to do it in the context of a marriage like the Bible says, and you don't want a biblical sex ethic, then you just do whatever you want. You live above the Word and you pick the pieces you like and you leave the rest. But when you live under the authority of Scripture, then Scripture gets to have authority over every area of your life. That's a key, key difference and what we're saying as a church, because you and I are called to conform our lives to the Word of God and be transformed by it. That means there'll be times when I'm preaching or you're reading the Bible that you're irritated because you have a, you have a thought process, you have a mentality that the Bible is coming against. And you're resisting it because it wasn't the way you were taught, and it doesn't feel good. And I don't want to do that. And they want me to do what with my money? My money belongs to me. But the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that the very air that you breathe belongs to him. So everything belongs to him, although you possess everything, all things, but everything belongs to him. You're a manager. How many recognize you're a manager over everything? Yeah, because that's what the Scripture said. But if you're not under the authority of Scripture, you're like, I'll do what I want to with my stuff. Right. See? Changes things. 
And this is where we're distinct in the sense that we're saying, according to 2 Timothy 3 and 16, this, notice what it said. All Scripture, say all. all. Say it louder than that. Say all. All, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is impossible for you to serve God in the ways that you desire to without a relationship with the Word of God because how would you know how to walk with Him? The Word of God becomes the guidebook for your life. To not have a relationship with the Word of God is to be disconnected from the instructions that will lead you along a path of righteousness, right living before the Lord. You need the map. Be surprised how many people are trying to get whatever it is they're trying to get apart from God rather than living under the authority of the Scriptures. As a church, we're going to use the Scriptures as our authority. It is our truth. It is our foundation. It is the first rung, as it were, on the house that we're building. It is foundational to everything. Not only that, the Bible says people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We live by the Word. We're nourished by it. We're fed by it. We're sustained by the words of God. I don't know about you, but in this day and age, I need to know what God has said because everybody's talking. And everybody that's talking, I got to fact check them. Come on, somebody. Because it's a funny to me how the facts get confused in our day and age. And I don't know who to believe, ABC, CBS, NBC, CSNBC, Fox News, CNN. They're all lying to me, and they all have an agenda. So don't espouse your, not your news outlets truth. What does the Word of God say? What has God said? I would love to hear a church begin to say to me, this is what God has said to my life, is saying to me about my marriage. This is what God is saying about our children from the Word of God, not from some teacher. It's great to have a teacher. It's great to have mentors. But how many of you know you've got one father in the faith, and that is Jesus? You need him more than you need anything else. Give the Lord a hand clap right now. <laughs> Psalms 119 and 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. It's my compass. It's my guide. It is also enduring and eternal. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Matthew 24 and 25. It's the word of God that we built this thing on. It's the word of God for 38 years, for 83 years. It's the word of God that this house has been built on. It's been preached. It's proclaimed. It's been prophesied. It is and will be and shall continue to be the word of God as our foundation. Amen? Amen. Second thing, the next level up is prayer. Jesus was frustrated at, at looking at the money changers in the temple courts in Matthew chapter 21. And in verse 13, he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. It is, if, if his house is supposed to be a house of prayer, then his people ought to be a people of prayer as well. And one of the things that, that I, I love is my, one of the monthly gatherings that we get together and I love and experience is the encounter nights, which are the first Wednesdays of every month. You don't have to mark it down in your calendar. And I mean, mark it down in your calendar. We're going to have them until Jesus comes back, unless there's certain holidays and different things. But, but, but that time is the time when we get together specifically as a people to come together and to pray, to intercede, to make supplication. It's an encounter night. We call it encounter night because we want to press in more than what we can on a Sunday morning to prayer to lifting one another up, to lifting the needs of our country and the world up before the Lord. Would you please mark that in your calendar as a monthly reoccurring appointment, 7 o'clock, first Wednesday of the month. Be here with us, short word at the beginning, and then we go to prayer and worship. It is essential. In fact, listen to what is said in the Scriptures in, in 1 Timothy 2 and 3. It says, therefore... I exhort, first of all, this is Paul writing to Timothy as a pastor, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men. Say all. all. Say all. all. That's Republican. That's liberal. Liberal. Come on, somebody. What did I say? <laughs> that's every party. 
That's every enemy, that's every persecutor, that's everybody that doesn't live like you live, all men. What would happen if the church stopped posting, texting, tweeting about who they don't like and who they agree and who they disagree with, and they just went to intercessory prayer? In fact, I would say go to intercessory prayer before you do anything else. Y'all not talking to me. What would happen if we stopped criticizing the things that we've seen in our world? I went to Eugene, Oregon re, uh, this weekend to see my son get married, and I noticed that they have the same issue with homelessness that we have. And some of you are like, ah, I just don't know what they're going to do. And, and, rah, rah, rah. and before we started grumbling, what if God did something in our hearts and our hearts were broken for the things that break his heart? Do you think that God's heart is broken over homelessness? Those are his children. What if one of your children was on drugs, strung out, or mentally ill and left you and was estranged by you and were living in a trailer somewhere or a tent under a bridge? How, how would that impact your heart, your child? Guess what? Everyone that you see in one of these tents is somebody's child. I often wonder, do they even know that their child is living how they're living? Or maybe they're estranged, and maybe they've been addicted for years and finally burned every bridge in their family, and, and they found themselves in this condition. Do you know that, that the Holy Spirit will go places that Christians and the church won't go? Do you know that? Like, 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 like literally, I don't know what the solution is. And he's like, well, Pastor Keith, are you? No, I, I recognize they're destroying property and the economy and different things. I got it. But, but that's not my first thought. My first thought is, God, help my heart because something's wrong here, and I don't know what the solution is. Do we warehouse them? And I know it's our tax dollars, but, but there's something about it that ought to drive you to prayer. Because for all I know, the solution for each county is sitting in these pews. One of you in prayer could be given the idea, the strategy, or at least a piece of it through prayer that begins to change things. The same way it was with a lady sitting here that started my father's house. And now she's housing families in, in, or shepherd's door. And now these ladies can come in with their children and get restarted and replanted. I don't know where the next idea is. I can promise you it's not in Washington, D.C. It is in the hearts of God's people that something could happen and change. So we've got to be a house of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 7 says, rejoice always. Verse 17, pray continually. <laughs> used, to be, used to be that we would say, can you just pray one hour? How many ladies in here uh, are in love with somebody? Just wave your hand, ladies. You're in love. Just wave your hand. You got a husband. You, if you sit next to your husband, you should have been raising your hand. <laughs> I'm just telling you, if you sit next to your husband and you didn't raise your, raise your hand, I know what y'all going to have for lunch. <laughs> Conversation. Ladies, how would you like it if I told you that that person who you're in love with is going to love you for one hour a day? That's it. That's all you get, girl. One hour, that's all you're getting. Why would we do that to the Lord and just say, hey, I'm going to talk to you at 5.30 in the morning, whenever it is, for that one hour, if we can last an hour, hello. And then the rest of the day I'm going to go as if you don't exist. In fact, I'm going to go the rest of the week. I'm going to come to church on Sunday, and then I'm going to get my little fill up, my little joy juice in Jesus. <laughs> and then I'm going to live the rest of my week the way that I want to, oblivious to you and what you might want. I'm not going to talk to you at work. In fact, my work is a whole separate compartment. I'll do what I want at work because I got some business deals I need to make. And you know, if Jesus gets in your business deals, you're going to have to be generous to people, and you're going to have to love people, you're going to have to be kind to people. So it's just easy to keep Jesus out of that space. But you know what I notice about Jesus? He will not listen to that nonsense. <laughs> Hello, online family. Do you recognize that Jesus will mess with you and get all in your business? Yes. Let's be in constant contact with him. Let's practice his presence all day. Why don't you set like a 9 o'clock? A 12 o'clock, a 3 o'clock, a 6 o'clock sort of memory on your phone. It's not, listen, it's not the quantity of time, it's the quality. 
What if you stopped every so often during the course of your day and just practiced being quiet before the Lord? And just said, God, I just, for a few moments, the day is getting crazy, just for a few moments, I'm just going to go out to my car and sit during my break this time and practice your presence. I just want to talk to you. Sometimes, how many recognize sometimes prayer is not about you talking? Yeah. You know how Pentecostals are. We get in and start yelling at God, in Jesus' name. I shake the foundation in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. That's how I grew up in church. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, don't do that at work. They ain't coming to church with you, I promise. I promise. They're not coming with you, I promise. You got the point, right? Here's the promise, 1 John 5 and 15, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have it when we ask him. He's a good father. Come on, somebody. Ask. And, and watch this. Ask for more than just your stuff. Come on, young people, ask for more than just you and your family and your house and, and what you need. How about, how about you start praying for some expansive things and asking God for the city, and then maybe God will give you something else and give you a bigger heart. All of a sudden, young people, now he's saying, hey, not only that, but I want you to cover the nations of the earth. Not only that, now that you pray, I want to send you there. How about the next level? You ready? Let's go up another level. So we got one, the word, prayer. We're going up now. Worship. Psalms 150 says it this way. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Come on. Did, did we just do that? Praise him in the sanctuary. But then it goes on. Watch this. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him for the sounding of the trumpet with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Whoa, we can dance? Some of y'all get into praise and worship, y'all like this. Y'all look scared. I mean, did you know you can worship God? It's funny to me because when people get into church, they immediately get stiff and looking around scared. But if I took you down to USC's campus to watch the beavers beat them into the ground yesterday, you would have lost your mind. Some of you said, no, it would have been the ducks. Well, whoever. Can I, can I tell you that, that it's okay for you to go into some deeper waters? That, that you should ask the Lord to do something in your heart that moves you past worshiping your personality and into the waters where you lose yourself in praise and worship. Half the time I have to close my eyes sometimes in worship. Because you see all kinds of things in worship, especially on the stage. You see people standing in worship. And we're singing and we're giving our hearts over to the Lord in worship and in song. And you see people just... You know how discouraging that is to the worship team? But, but more indicative, and for me as a pastor, I'm thinking, what's going on in your heart that we could be in the presence of God in his sanctuary? Come on, somebody. Because I promise you, anybody that has a revelation of who God is, their hearts overflow with adoration and praise beyond your personality. And just so you know, if the angel Gabriel or, Mar or, one of the Mi or Michael came into this place and stood, you would fall down prostrate in front of one of those angels, I promise you. And that's not even the surpassing greatness of our God. That's just a created being. What, what do you think is going to happen when Jesus is exalted and high and lifted up? You know what's going to happen? You're going to... So that's why when we get into the sanctuary, clapping your hands, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. There's a place for clapping, shouting, laying prostrate. There's also a place, hello Pentecostal spirit-filled people, of being quiet. <laughs> Silence before the, the, the presence of God. All of that's welcome. When's the last time you were in the presence of God, not here or, or here or at your home, where you were so caught up in the presence of God that you got on your knees and said, oh, God, you're, you're too great. Or you laid out in the floor under the weight of his glory. I pray, just so you know, I pray that God so filled this house when we gather that you can't stand that his presence is so thick, so thick that I don't have to preach because his presence is here. 
that, that, that healing happens, not because a man did anything, but because God did. Or maybe one of our vocalists is singing their hearts out before the Lord, and all of a sudden they pierce the heavens in some way, and His glory comes in. That's what we want. Some of you are like, what would happen then? <laughs> ho, 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 ho. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Marriages healed. Fathers being reunited with their, with their children. Generations caught up in the presence of God and the glory of God. Why? Because he's good and he loves to reveal himself. Amen? But, but, but we, can't, we can't relegate worship to God to songs only. Just so you know, if you're not singing at home, something's wrong. You should be singing worship at home. You should be in your shop where you're tinkering with your cars or whatever you're doing and put on some worship and honor God in that way. In your cubicle at work, you could establish the dominion of God. In fact, my, my grandmother in the old saints in the black church would say, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. And I want them to come down in your workplace, in your community, in your garage, when your family gathers together. We want the blessing of God to come down. And all you have to do is send the praise and worship up. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right now. Right? So we're going to press more into the presence of God as a people. But, but Romans chapter 12 expands on this a bit in verse 1. This is, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is your reasonable act of worship. That not just the songs are worship, but how you live is worship. How you play is worship. How you work is worship. All of it, your entire life. Just so you know, everything is worship to the Lord. When you're with your family, it's worship. When you gather together. Just so you know, God wants you to worship him and recognize that how you live is an act of worship to him. That's why it's important for you to make sure you start your day in worship. Because why? How you begin is ultimately how you finish. I want my days to be full of God's purposes. I want my days to be full of the glory of God, for him to be present and active in my life when I meet people. So it doesn't surprise me when I run into people and all of a sudden they say, oh my God, I didn't think I would see you. I'm thinking to myself, okay, God, this is an appointment you arranged. And immediately I say to myself, okay, God, what's, what's your plan? What are you doing here? What's the, what's the purpose here? What, why did this person call me? Why are they? If usually God puts somebody on my heart. I'll reach out to them and say, oh my God, I can't believe you text me right now. And I'm like, yep, I can. Why? Because it's not odd to me. Because it's happened so much. Because you don't even realize how many times God would use you if you just be available and sensitive so distracted, so busy with everybody. Some of you are so busy making money, you don't realize that money comes from God. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You think he might give you one or two. It's not how, it, listen, watch this. It's not how many hours you work and you're just the work ethic and 60 hours a week and 70 hours a week. And I just got to work and man shouldn't eat if he doesn't work. I got you. But there's something called the grace and the favor of God on your life. That when the favor and the grace of God on your life is, you can do less and earn more. And if you're in a situation where you're working so daggone hard that you can't even stop to breathe, to even love your family well, to be present with them, then you're missing the harvest that God wants to give to you, and you're working on a plantation arranged by the devil. He's stealing memories, moments. You don't even get to rest. You don't get to soak in the blessing of your own labor. That's not God's will for your life. You need to rearrange that thing and think about it and say, God, wait a minute. If I'm worshiping you, then the blessing will flow. And you just heard the song, accept it. Some things come by grace, not because you work for them. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. I know I'm messing. I know I'm messing. Another distinction for us that becomes a pillar is this idea of the missional church. You are, I don't know if you knew it or not, but you're a missionary. Say, I'm a missionary. You're a sent one. You're a messenger sent with the gospel. Maybe not globally, 
but you are certainly sent to your community. You are certainly sent to your family. They don't come here. And we should stop getting into this idea that all of ministry has to happen in this building. If we learn nothing from 2020, is that God doesn't need a building to sustain his church. While we were so busy trying to get back into buildings, God was trying to get back into hearts. There's nothing wrong with the building. This is a blessing. All you have to do is go to a persecuted country and understand how blessed you were to stand in a building of your choosing and to worship God freely as you desired. But that's not all there is. And if all your worship is done here and not there, then we've missed something. Because the world, the harvest that you're trying to reach is there. So it's necessary that they hear some loud noise emanating from your house from time to time. And they're like, man, what are they listening to at this hour in the morning? It's worship to the, oh, that's my house, not yours, my fault. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. I want some bold speakers. I told my wife, I need some better speakers. She's like, why? I said, because I need it loud. <laughs> How many of you like loud worship music? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I need it loud in my house. I, I, something about it when it starts, because you know what I need? I need it loud to drown out that I'm off key. Come on, y'all. <laughs> I'm not gifted with that gift. But we're sent. We're ever expanding the kingdom. Matthew 24 and 14 says it this way. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. I don't know if you realize it or not, but there are places in the world where people still haven't heard the gospel one time. That there are places in the world right now where people cannot read the Bible in their own language. That has not been printed. So how can they know unless preachers are sent? They can never know. Some of you are sent. Some of you are senders. You have a grace on your life for resources and finances. So you get to resource others as they go and as they carry the gospel. We've got to do that locally, nationally, and all over the world. Can you say amen? The Bible says this about us in Matthew 28. It's a great commission. I'll read it again. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve everything I've commanded you. Jesus said this upon his resurrection and to comfort his disciples. And as he administered to them before he left, he said these words in John chapter 20 and 21. He says, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Can I ask you a question? Do you know who you're sent to. Because everybody's sent. I was sent to East Hill, to Gresham. Come on, y'all. Where have you been sent? Do you know the people that you've been sent to? That is your job, it's your classroom, it's your campus. Do you recognize that if you're a young person sitting here and you're in high school, that your campus is where you've been sent? That when's the last time that you walked your campus and prayed? I know you want to be cool and want to get to the game and want to get to the dance. I got all of that, and, and you should. Hello, somebody. But you also should recognize that it's your harvest field, that you've been sent there, that there are people, and you're sitting under the sound of my voice right now, there's people on your campus that don't know the gospel like you do, don't have a mom and dad to bring them to church. So how do you think they're going to find out about him? They're learning about Jesus by how you live for him on campus. And if you live for him, then it becomes a message that they need to hear. Come on, somebody. All right? How about this one? Spirit empowered. This is another pillar for us. We are not sent here to live for God without the empowerment to do it. In fact, one of the things that was said about the church, the first century church, is Jesus told them, don't go anywhere. Don't go do anything. Don't witness. Don't share. Don't give the testimony. Don't say anything. Acts chapter 1 and 8 says it this way, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world. You and I are called to be empowered witnesses. In fact, the Spirit of the Lord is available for you because you cannot live for God without it. You are called to live a spiritual life. There's spiritual empowerment to do it. When you were born again, the Spirit of God took up residence, not in this building. The Spirit of God took up residence inside each and every one of you. You are not powerless. Look at me. 
you are not powerless over circumstances, situations in your life, and, and you're not held captive by your personality unless you yield to it. You can be as powerful as you want to be as an introvert. Why? Because the lion of the tribe of Judah lives down on inside of you. It is not your ability to get yourself up and, and work yourself up or work out as much as you can to feel powerful. You are powerful because the God of the universe lives inside of you. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. It's important for you to know. What makes us distinct maybe from others is we believe that there's a subsequent baptism with the Holy Spirit that allows you then to become an empowered witness for him. You're born by the Spirit, but we also believe as a four-square, Spirit-filled Pentecostal church of a second subsequent experience called the baptism with the Holy Spirit that allows it to overflow your life as well. There are evidences of that. There are spiritual gifts and things that are released, and also the, the heavenly language is released for you as well. We're going to do a whole series on that for some of you that have never heard, and it's out of balance for some people. And so we're going to make sure that we teach you so that you can flow in it. But you're called to be a powerful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to baptize you, yes? But, but you can't do anything without the Spirit. How do you live for Him? How do I know how to live? The Bible says in John chapter 16 and verse 13 that the Spirit of truth will come and guide you into all truth. The culture is not my guide. Hello, young people. Dismantling. If, 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 here's, let me go back to the Word real quick. If you don't agree that the Word of God is infallible, that is God breathed. If you don't agree with that, that is God's word inspired over 1,500 years by over 60 different authors at different times, different stages, different occupations. We couldn't even get one message from this stage out to the back of the room and have it correct within this room in the same day. Could you imagine having a message cover 1,500 years and be right in sync with one another? Carrying it out. This is the Word of God. But when you don't believe that God actually, that this is the truth, then you literally have no hope in this world. Where does truth come from? Truth comes from whoever says whatever they says, whoever says it loud enough, whoever's the most popular voice, the most charismatic voice. I mean, no, we need truth. Yeah. Say truth. truth. And the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us to all truth. Luke chapter 4 and 18 says it this way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is what Jesus says. Because he has anointed me to proclaim, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set oppressed people free and to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Guess what? If he was in power that way, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Those same works are available for you to do. The challenge is that we don't believe it. We don't believe it. And the only way that you can nourish yourself into a position where you really start allowing those works to flow through your life is that you have nourished yourself on the Word of God, built yourself up so much so that you believe and begin to walk in that truth. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. How about this one? This is another pillar for us, the multi-generational church. Look around the room right now. Just look around your space. We're multi-generational and we're multi-ethnic. I'm going to get into both of those in a minute. That's important for you and I to realize. Listen to what Psalms chapter 78 says in verse 5. It says this, He decreed statutes to Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they will in turn would tell their children. See the generations? Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts are not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Can, can I be honest with, with how I feel as a father in the faith, now grandfather in the faith? It, it cracks me up how many people, all the young people, walk up to me and call me pop now. Um, that means I'm old. Hello, somebody. I, I won't go back to PK or pastor. Pop is just driving me nuts now. Don't let me stop. I don't care. It's an honor to, to actually grow old. But, but, but here's the thing that I realize. If we see anything, and I'm talking to those of you that are 50 and above, if we see anything in our culture with this generation that's suspect or broken or off or morality and this thing or that thing, whatever you see, it's an indictment on us. It's not an indictment on the young people. It's an indictment on us. That somehow the testimony of God's goodness and grace. And now, and some of you say, well, I did the best that I could. I got you. 
I'm not talking individually, I'm talking as a whole. That something is off, that this generation would be able to grow up and not think that anything was valuable or viable of our faith. That somehow we miss kind of like the U.S. track and field team in the 4 by 100 always seems to botch the handoff. They've got the right runners, but they never can get the baton passed. Whatever we see in the culture, whatever we see of young people right now, that's an indictment on us as mothers and fathers in the faith, that somehow we didn't transmit it to them in a package that they could receive. And most of the time, we talked about God, but we didn't live for him in front of them. More is caught than is taught. Did you ever realize that your kids do not do what you tell them to do? Isn't that right? They don't do what you tell them to do. They do what you do. If, you, if the Bible is important, guess what? It's because you made it important in your home, and they picked up on that, and they started saying stuff like, Dad, can I sit with you when you're reading the Bible? Can I have a cup of hot cocoa? I don't like coffee. Oh, that was in my house. Sorry. Do you know that they're watching you? You know what's, you know what's weird for me? Is sometimes Alara will be in the house, and she'll be doing like this in the back of the room. She just, she's sharp, man. And she'll say stuff that, that we said and that she shouldn't say. <laughs> Mostly Keisha's fault. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's the mama. That's her fault. I'm just a grandparent. Not my job. But, but what's happening is, is she's catching things. She's watching. If you want the house of the Lord to be a priority for them, then guess what? You got to make the house of the Lord a priority. It's just got to be that way. Are you with me? So we're called, and just so you know, I'm going to take the pressure off my youth pastors. It is not their job to put a foundation down in your child's life. That's not their job. That's your job. You can't abdicate what, math, what Psalm 78 says about you passing the testimony down in your house to your children, and you're going to think that they're going to raise your child in the things of God with one hour a week? No. It's... It's our job to come alongside of you, to partner with you, but it is ultimately you that stands before the Lord for your household. Are you with me? Oh, look, look how quiet it is. Okay, Arlen, I'm going to find something they like here in a minute. <laughs> we've got to be a gener- we've got to be a people that values the next generation, which means that we're going to be it's going to be a little louder, a little messier. Some of y'all like loud. Come on, y'all. How many of you like loud? Lift your hands. Okay. Don't come at 9 o'clock. We're not as loud, just so you know. We want to make sure that everybody, because we're multi-generational, that means we got to make space for everybody. And that's harder to do. If we just were going to be interested in one generation and just say, oh, we're just going after the young people, then we wouldn't do things the way we do. We want the whole family at the table. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right now. <laughs> Multi-ethnic. At the end of the age, here's, here's what the Scripture says in Revelation 7 and 9. And after this, I looked, John the Revelator is writing, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every tribe, from every nation, every tribe, people, language, and standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. At the end, every tribe, every nation, every tongue will be standing around the great white throne. You know what's good about that? We get to practice that now. I love, I love looking out at the service right now because I see Asian Americans, I see Hispanics, and I see some Haitians in our midst, which, by the way, you couldn't have looked at the news reports this week and seen Haitians being whipped by Border Patrol agents, even though you say, well, yeah, but they're here illegally. I got you. They still deserve humane treatment. But, but you might not know this, but, but our brother Benel, stand up with you and your family. Stand up right here. They're from Haiti. Wait, wait, don't clap, don't clap, don't clap. They're from Haiti. I want you to understand, no, listen, they're from Haiti. So that means when you see things on the news that deal with Haitians, you have a family member. It's not just a news issue or a political issue or a policy issue. That brother has an East Hill shirt on, which means he serves and gets services every time you come through the doors. A Haitian man and his family has been serving you. Now give them a big hand and let them know you love them. We're multi-ethnic. That means things outside our culture matter. 
That means if you're white, you got to start having a black experience, a Hispanic experience. That means if I'm black, I got to start understanding an Asian experience, and therefore I'll get a little more quieter. Because <laughs> my Asian brothers and sisters are a little more reserved. That means we're like Paul. We became all things to all men that we might win some. That means that things matter that affect people far near and far from us. Because why? They're God's children. You think God doesn't see all this chaos and mayhem and oppression and what would drive some? I saw a picture. I saw a picture that, that brought me to tears. It was a Haitian man up to his neck in water walking with a child that was big enough to sit on his head. It must have been like six, six to seven months sitting on his head while he was, the baby was screaming, scared to death. And he was trying to keep his head above water, walking to something better, hopefully. I know. We got immigration issues. I got you. All that stuff. And yet, somebody from their country thought the conditions were so deplorable, so tragic, so violent in the streets that they would just try to cross water with their child and whatever few items they had with them. I don't know what those solutions are, but I can tell you what. It's not pulling my heart back and not allowing it to affect me and then hiding out behind some political platitude. That's not what Christians do. We figure out, God, what do we do? God, these are your children. These are our brothers and sisters. How do we help? How do we serve? Surely it is not with a whip. And lastly, the church. Say the church. Say the church. Yep, we're a hot mess. We got issues, all kinds of brokenness, all types of inconsistencies, and yet the church. Say the church. Somebody say it like my black grandma would say, say the church. The church is the hope of the world. The church is the hope of the world. The church is still the hope of the world. Jesus said, I will build my church. And literally the gates, the strategies, the counsel of hell would not prevail against it. So no matter what you think about the church, the church is this, the church is that, and mm, I, I got you. It is. And somebody said, the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. I said, you're right. <laughs> totally it is. And the church is this, and the church is that, and it's that. Yup, it is, totally. All of humanity is in the church. All the inconsistencies, all the habits, all the proclivities, it's all here. Hello, y'all. We got all kinds of sick people here. Got all kinds of brokenness here. Got all kinds of addiction here. This is not a place where you have to hide that. It's not a place where you have to shrink back in shame because you got something going on in your life. It's on your pew. It's on your row. Everybody in here has some level of brokenness, trauma that they're trying to deal with and move forward in. And God is a restoring, reconciling, healing, and delivering God so they're in the right place. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. I mean that. Same for you online. You're online with us. You're in church. I want you to say, I am so glad that I'm here. Would you please pray over my addiction and name it without shame? I want you to know that this church has been here and will be here for a long time. We're inheriting a legacy. And I want to show you something right now that's special that we created to let you know when we say this is us, we're reaching back into the past, pulling it forward into our present, and building toward our future in this. Take a look at this right now. From the beginning, anyone can see that East Hill Church has had a call to be a lighthouse on a hill for the local community and to the world. When you walk through its history, God's faithfulness and favor is woven into the church's DNA, starting all the way back in 1938 with Art Winther and Roy Maurer. These two gentlemen were instrumental in starting the Foursquare meetings in Gresham. Unfortunately, when World War II hit, the church was temporarily disbanded for almost two decades. But through the God-given vision laid on the hearts of Joseph Emery Burnett and his wife Winifred, God breathed new life into the Gresham area again. 
The year was 1955, and the Burnettes were hosting services out of the Moyer Theater, which played movies during the week. By 1956, the church had enough members to reactivate the original church charter, and Gresham Foursquare was reborn. With 25 members, they moved from the theater to a small building on 4th Street downtown. Over the next 10 years, the church would see a handful of pastors transition in and out of leadership, and even still, the church continued to grow. On July 4th, 1965, Jerry Cook assumed the pastorate of Gresham Foursquare. That same year, the church moved its 50-member congregation from the small 4th Street building to a building on Division Street. It was there that the church officially changed its name to East Hill Church. During the 60s and 70s, East Hill had unprecedented growth and a wide-reaching public ministry. The heart of Jerry Cook's ministry was to be a welcoming refuge for people who had been bruised, battered, and rejected by the world. Jerry published the book, Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness, which defined the church's philosophy of ministry. East Hill became known as a hospital, a place where people not only heard, but also experienced the love and acceptance of Jesus Christ. By 1974, East Hill was the state's largest and fastest growing church. That year, there were 700 official members and over 3,000 weekend attendees. The church was growing at such a rate that the building literally could not hold all the people. In December 1976, the church purchased the Multnomah County Fairgrounds property with the vision that it would be used to reach out with God's love to the surrounding city. That decision alone would impact generations to come. Today, we are seeing that prophetic vision being played out on a weekly basis as the church operates to serve the community. In 1983, Jerry Cook had a heart attack that disabled him for some time. Between the lack of senior leadership and the overwhelming financial burden of a large mortgage, the strain on East Hill was great. The church was at a pivotal point in its history. It was then that Dr. Benjamin T. Roberts, better known as Pastor Ted, was appointed lead pastor. He was sent to East Hill with the expectation that he would have to close the church. However, God had other plans. Along with his wife, Diane, Ted came with the call to be his hands extended to a hurting world. In the months that followed, the church experienced a 64% growth in membership. Because of this steady growth, there were a number of remodels and expansions that took place from 1987 to 2003. These remodeled areas included the office complex, the youth center, the children's ministry building, what we now know as Kid City, as well as the Kid Zone area on the east side of the auditorium. And of course, the auditorium itself. As the space for families expanded, so did the capacity for ministry. On Easter weekend in 2001, there were over 10,000 attendees. Over the course of his time as lead pastor, Ted authored books that would minister to people around the world for years to come, one of which included Pure Desire. The worldwide ministry that would come from Pure Desire would eventually be where Pastor Ted and Diane continued their calling to be his hands extended to a hurting world. Fast forward to August 25th, 2007, when Jason and Nikki Albello took up the mantle as lead pastors of East Hill. No strangers to the church, having grown up in it as children, they were perfectly positioned for the task at hand. Pastor Jason tackled his mission with zeal, as any good Marine pastor would, but moreover, he embodied that relationships were what mattered most, which is why the main church value became Relationships First, and its official name changed to East Hill Church Family. The church continues to be a place where people are led into a loving and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This discipleship was not just for the people of Gresham, but extended to reach nations across the world. Jason and Nikki's passion for mission work launched missionaries and built relationships with foreign leaders around the globe. From 2001 to 2019, Jason took over a dozen trips to Nigeria, South Africa, Poland, Turkey, and Mexico. Many of the relationships that were built with the pastors in those countries continue today. The water wells dug in Nigeria were all due to the efforts and faithfulness of the East Hill Church body through the raising of funds and the lifting of prayers. They provide, along with the churches, schools, and medical buildings that have come with them, living water for all those who come to them. 
One of Jason and Nikki's largest contributions to the church as a whole is not only their years of being steadfast shepherds, but the countless hard decisions they made navigating through a changing economy to get Eastill to a place of being completely debt free. This set a financially healthy trajectory for East Hill that we celebrate to this day. One young leader who was raised up under the care of the Albello's leadership said, the biggest impact that Jason and Nikki had on East Hill was one of breaking up ground and sowing seeds that we are able to now reap the harvest of for years to come. It was through that breaking of ground, God was planting new dreams in the Albello's hearts to release their pastoral roles at East Hill into the hands of its next shepherds. That baton would be passed on to the one and only Keith and Coco Jenkins. On October 17, 2019, Pastor Keith, better known as PK, and Coco were installed as the newest lead pastors in a long line of pastoral legends. East Hill buzzed with excitement, but no one could have foreseen the unique and mountainous challenges that lay ahead. 2020 presented obstacles the church had never seen before. Brilliantly, PK and Coco led East Hill through the pandemic with quarantine and the building being closed, social injustice and political unrest, and economic uncertainty. At the start of 2021, the word of the Lord for the year was to return and rebuild, and East Hill has done exactly that. With a bright future ahead, East Hill continues to be a place where Jesus is at the center of everything. There is grace-filled love and acceptance as the people extend their hands to serve and disciple a hurting world. With such a rich history and deep roots to its family tree, there's no limit to the impact that East Hill will have on the local community, the country, and to the world for generations to come. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap. That's been good. Would, would you stand to your feet with me? Um, we're about to leave. Um, one of the things that is super humbling is to be in the presence of legends and one of your predecessors. And so every week I usually get a text message from Ted to encourage, inspire, um, to affirm my leadership. And I think it would be remiss of us to not recognize a living legend in our midst and standing right here, Ted and Diana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come on, you do better than that. Come on. You do better than that. Unfortunately, sometime we wait until people are gone before we give them their flowers. And uh, you're still here kicking and, and doing what you do. And we love you and appreciate you. And I want you to know that we recognize uh, Coco and I and our leadership team, we, we talk about it often, that we stand on the shoulders of those that have come before us. That fortunate for me, I live in a house that I didn't build. I'm eating from a vineyard that I didn't plant. And that the years of hardness that Jason has gone through, that you guys went through and that Jerry went through, there's seeds in the ground that are coming up now. Should have been harder for us during the pandemic, but you went before us and you prayed before us, and you prayed with us. But there were things in the grounds, and I always say this when I walk through here, there's things in the bones of the place. It's the spiritual legacy that we inherited. Now, obviously, I'm not you because you're you. And so we have to figure out a way to, to take what you gave us, put it in a new package in this generation, and move forward with the prophetic vision of the Lord in a way that honors the Lord and honors the legacy that you gave us. We're moving toward that. Well, we wouldn't be here without you. And so anytime that you walk in this building, I want you to just do so with a full heart, knowing that things are well in hand in this period of time and that God has done something for us. We would not be here had you not said yes. Come on, give him another hand right now. Thank you. Love you, man. So guess what? I wanted to finish this series with that video and thank you for Kelsey and the team for putting that together. It was so well done. But I wanted you to recognize, because sometimes, especially if you're young, you think, oh yeah, it's church, blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I got you. But I just want you to know that there was people that came before you that made this place available for you now. So when we ask you to serve and ask you to give financially and ask you to participate, it's because of this legacy of what God was doing. And now we get the honor and the privilege in our leg of the race to continue what God started. We get to be a vessel, an instrument, and partner with the Holy Spirit in our generation to see other men and women come into the kingdom of God, not just locally, as you could see, but globally. Would you do me a favor and just... So there's two ways, two postures in church and in worship. One is a receiving or, or actually a surrendering posture where we lift our hands. Another is a receiving posture where we put our hands in front of us and we can receive something. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your hands out like this to receive. And I want to pray over you. But before I do, I want you to ask the Lord, just in your own heart, your own way, don't nobody hear you. Ask the Lord, what is he requiring of you in this leg of the race, in this season? How do you participate in building the legacy for the future for those that will come behind us through the Lord Terry? Same thing for you online. And I want you to receive the blessing of this house, the impartation of this house in your house in your family, in your marriage, for your children and their generations, that there would be goodness and mercy on you all the days of your life, that the face of the Lord would shine on you, that his loving kindness would be present in your home and in your life, that the love of God would be shed abroad in your hearts, that you would have a deep sense of joy and peace in uncertain times. That you would know that the Lord is indeed shepherding you. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the under-shepherd, but we have a good shepherd. And he's leading and guiding us to green pastures and still waters. Even in the midst of a torrent in our culture. God, thank you for the peace. Lord, impart health, wholeness, prosperity to your people. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are doing, Lord. And what you will do into the future. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. It's a good thing. As you go, let me remind you of this. I, I, I'm baffled by how many conversations I have with people that have come and given their life to the Lord, and they say, I had this conversation with such and such or this person. It's always through a relationship. So would you please continue to invest in relationships and then at the appropriate time, invite somebody to God's house with you. Amen. Go with God. God's going to go with you. I love you. Take care.